Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Oh man, good to see your smiling faces. Let me see again, how many were here Friday? If you were here Friday, lift your hand up. How many were not here Friday? Uh, rest of y'all okay that's cool uh listen yeah just so just so you know uh we're not going to be able to go back through it but you know we have come through some things sometimes we step up and because i stand next to this beautiful woman uh people see us as born with silver spoons in our mouths and so on and so forth but we've been through some stuff my wife and i was married 10 years divorced we were pastoring when we were divorced there was a broken uh, marriage on uh, and various things that took place in our Go back and watch Friday. You'll see it. And, and when God restored our family, we went with an accident that uh, broke her neck and broke her back, fractured every, almost every bone in her face, and killed our nine-year-old twin son. So for those of you that are kind of judging the church and you're judging us right now, and this is what I felt even during worship. There's some people came in here, and you've got that spirit on you right now. You're like, I'm not sure about all this. That's cool because you don't have to believe to belong. You, you don't have to believe to belong. We just believe if you keep coming around, you'll experience such a love of God, you won't be able to deny that Jesus is the real deal. And uh, it's, it's not about perfect people, and I love that. If it were about perfect people, we'd all be in trouble. And so we're so glad you're here. Even if you've got that thing in your heart that you're a little, you're a little against organized religion, good, because we are too. Yeah. Uh, we're about a relationship with yeah. Jesus Christ. We're not into religion. We're into relationships. And our first relationship is with Jesus. Amen? That's right. Come on and say amen. Amen. And, and you know, I, the way it is when, yeah, hold on. Sorry. My, <laughs> Hold on just a moment. And, and, and the way it works with us, like any other pastors, saying a man is like saying sick him to a dog. So if you say sick him to a dog, the faster they hunt. If you say a man, the faster we get out. Amen? Yeah, you know, some of y'all ready to go right now. All right. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I do say is, um, you know, our lives is a testimony of God's goodness, his faithfulness, and hope. And our motto of our church is a church that cares where you're going. And, and not, not where, where you've been. been. And that was written for our lives. Yeah. Because we truly do, and I know this church also believes, we do care about the destiny that you have. You might have been through brokenness. You might have experienced pain. You might have experienced a lot of choices that you made even in your own life that you're ashamed of or that you wish you wouldn't have made. But God has a brand new start, a brand new beginning. He's got a today is a new day for you, and you can hope in him and know that he's got a bright future for you because he cares about where you're going. Not where you've been, but he does care about where you're going, and he wants to be with you every step of the way. Yeah, and also for those of you that came in, you're thinking maybe that's impossible, your life's impossible, you're just toughing it out. Can I just say this to you? Uh, maybe you're like, well, I doubt this thing. Can I just say we've all doubted this thing? Yeah. Uh, there's times we've all doubted Jesus. How many's doubted Jesus since you've been born again? Be honest, how many have doubted Jesus Question. since you've been born again? Question. I've doubted Jesus in the last month. Um, <laughs> just when you start to look at impossibilities, you've just got to build your faith again yes. in Jesus. Amen? Yes. And so we're just here to be real with you, to, be, to just be raw with you. And we have some things we want to share that's going to affect all relationships, not just marriage, but all family and even friendships. But before we do, I, I want to return those words of your pastors. Uh, we've watched your pastors when they were uh, just newly, not born, not born again long when we first met them really, and watch them serve through uh, their first year or two of being Christians and, and as they were greeters and ushers, and then I watched them lead teams, and I've watched them grow, and when I see what they've done here in eight years after starting with 12 people, and I see how God is blessing the movement of Elevate Church, and I see exactly what's happening by the Spirit of Almighty God directing and leading, and you're a part of that, that's awesome, you hold their hands up. Can I, can I just say this as well? You need to understand that your pastors are the best pastors you could possibly have. God sent them to you. They're a gift according to Ephesians. So I want you to do me a favor, really. I want you to put your hands together. I want you to let your pastors know that you believe they are the best pastors around. Come on, let them know. Come on, give it up. Give it up. Let them know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. 
And uh, my wife will tell you, I don't like all pastors. Um, and, 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 and the minute I met them, I liked them, and I've continued to like them through the years. So we appreciate them right. and their spirit so much. So we want to talk to you about I love, some of these things. I love what they've invested into you, even just doing this series and having this conference for you. They love you, and they want the best for you. They want success for you. And it does take a village. We are all here doing life together, and we are better together. Yeah. So stay connected to those that are right beside you and jump in and even get more more involved in what you are right now. You know, with our life, with our marriage, and with our children and parenting, you know, experience actually transcends even theory or beliefs. I mean, experience by what I'm saying here is, you know how you said you were only going to have one child, or you were going to have six children, and after you have one, you're like, oh, one is enough. (laughs) Or maybe you were the parent, or before you had kids, you said, yeah, my kid will never do that. The fit throwing and the, re- the restaurant experiences and things like that. You learn through experience. Yeah. And it's like when you have your first child and you're so, you know, protective. And, and not that you're not always protective, but, you know, that first child, you just, you know, you want to do everything right. So you're like calling the, the babysitter every five minutes, making sure that that baby is okay. Then baby two comes along and you're walking out the door ready to date and you're like, Oops, before I forget, here's our phone number in case an emergency happens. <laughs> and then the third baby comes, and you give instructions specifically to the babysitter. Don't call me unless you see blood. <laughs> <laughs> That's experience of life. And we are here to tell you all the things that, you know, we have learned from, and we are the poster children for what not to do. And, and we just definitely want to give you our lives and the journey of our lives. of giving you tools how to have the successful family and the successful life that we have have so enjoyed having together and we had to do some specific things and we're going to give you those specific things today so that you can hopefully have the joyful peaceful loving home that we are offered to have today yeah years ago when we first got married of course there wasn't a lot of resources there wasn't a lot of mentoring there wasn't a lot of that stuff that went around nowadays there's all kinds of resources i said the earlier service there's like 101 dummies for everything right there's 101 dummies for relationships everything we need but back then it was just one of those things that you just jumped in and made sure the water was okay, and if it was over your head, you either sink or you drown. And so we jumped into it when we were very young, and and uh, I've learned this much through the years, that we've learned how to do it right now. Before, we were incorrect. Now we do it the right way because we've had to learn to do it the right way. We had to find the resource, and I've never knocked resource. We now deal with counseling. We go through counseling. We see communication coaches together still because I believe all of us need counseling for the rest of our lives. Can you say amen? Come on, look at someone and say, you need counseling. <laughs> and so with that being said, uh, the, the, the real book of wisdom, according to Scripture, is the Bible. That is the book of wisdom. We can find a lot of wisdom in friendships. We can find a lot of wisdom with counselors. But the wisdom must be based upon the word of God. It said, make sure you seek after wisdom. And with all you're seeking, get some understanding with that. So the first scripture I want to talk about today is right there in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 3. And it says, it takes wisdom to have a good family. It takes wisdom to have a good family. Everyone say wisdom. So it doesn't matter where you get it, but it must be built upon the book of wisdom, the Bible. So we want a good family. We've got to really delve into what God has for us. We've really got to find what the word says concerning relationships. I've got to know what the word says concerning our marriage and me as a husband. Then the scripture goes on to say, and it takes understanding to make it strong. So I don't want just a good family for a season. I want a good family that's strong throughout the season. I, I, I want a family that will last through all seasons. I want a family that built the house upon the rock, that when the winds come, the rains come, the flood comes, come on, our house stands. Why? Because we built it as a strong family upon the word of God. Amen? So with that, we're saying there's more to God than just weekend. There's more to God than just a Sunday experience. There's more to God than just coming hoping to get something to make it another week. That there's a relationship with Jesus Christ that builds wisdom into our life, that builds wisdom into our faith. And so that's the first thing we want to talk about, the necessities of a healthy family, necessities of healthy relationships. And the first one is authentic faith. Come on, everyone say authentic faith. 
authentic faith doesn't just show up on Sunday. Authentic faith doesn't just show up on the weekend and even serve. Authentic faith happens on Monday when you're home with your family. Authentic faith happens on Tuesday, Wednesday, even on hump day. We know we have authentic faith because we're building it daily. We don't just put on a faith face and walk in to invite someone to church. We live faith so they see the faith of Jesus Christ within my life, within our marriage, within our family, within our relationships. And then all of a sudden we begin to understand the authenticity of faith begins to change people's minds. We can come from behind the mask. We can come out from behind the facades. We can understand, as I said Friday night, we're real people with real problems in a real world, overcoming them with a real Jesus. Amen. And so us too, we're, we're, we're the same people. You can say, but pastor, we, you don't know what we've done. Yeah, you don't know what we've done either. You don't, know, you don't know my sins. You don't know my sins either. You don't know how hard it's been. We can all say, me too. Everyone say, me too. So your sins, they were dark. Me too. Your sins, they were problems. Me too. But by the grace and the goodness of God, faith comes in, changes everything, changes our family, changes our relationship because God is so good. Amen? I think that's vitally important we understand. Listen to this. Christians think authentic faith is meant to change the world. That's a great thought, but to change the world, we must first develop healthy relationships. The Bible says, by this they will know. By this they will know. That's right, because we will be the light that people will be able to see Jesus in us. Mm -hmm. The scripture says, Proverbs 14, 26, reverence the Lord. Reverence for the Lord gives a man deep strength. His children have a place of refuge and security. So the closer you get to God, the more of a relationship you have with Jesus, not just a a church going experience and not expecting the Sunday school people to teach our children about God, but literally having a wisdom of God that we, we ask the father for wisdom, how to train our children, how to handle the relationships in our lives, how to handle the difficulties and the conflicts Mm -hmm. that are going on in our family. When you ask for wisdom, wisdom and you seek wisdom, God and God alone can give it. But you've got to have that relationship that we're talking about, that you're literally listening to him. Because you can, you can have wisdom from the counselor, like my husband says, but when you seek after God and, and you listen quietly, it's when my husband and, and he's going at it, you know, and we're having a little bit of a, uh, 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 disagreement, disagreement, A highly expressive conversation. (laughs) And I walk out because I don't like what I'm hearing and I don't like what I'm, you know, experiencing with him. And I walk out and the Holy Spirit speaks to my heart. You need to go in and you need to say you're sorry. And I'm like, Mm. no, I'm not going to say I'm sorry. He's the one that did all this. The Holy Spirit's telling her that she's wrong. No. (laughs) You heard it. That's not true. I'm like, no, I don't want to say I'm sorry because I wasn't wrong. And I I had my rights for saying what I said. But the Holy Spirit is the one that brings us together. He's the one that brings peace to our home, even when we don't deserve it. He's the one that wants us to live in unity, to to live in peace, and he's going to give you the wisdom every single time to be able to do that. But starting at home is the key. I thought earlier as I was watching that family on the video, and he talked about his Sunday school teacher. That's awesome, Benny, right? Benny. I don't know who Benny is. No, Benny. No, Benny's on the video. They talked about... Let me do my part. Uh, he talked about Benny that works with Frank, right? And, and so I thought, man, I wish I would have had a Benny when I was a kid, right? Because I was that kid that always needed someone on them all the time. For me, it would have been like Benny and the Jets. I mean, it would, it, would, it would have taken the Benny and the Jets, right? But it's more than that. We've got to have more than just, it's got to be lived at the house. Come on, everyone say at the house. That's right. John thirteen thirty five says, by this, all will know that you are my disciples mm. if you have love for one another. And like we said just a minute ago, as long as people are seeing the love that we have for one another as a spouse, as a wife, as a husband, as a parent, and even as co-workers, you know, we, we want to show Jesus and we want to change the world and we want to make a difference in our world. Well, the difference that we're going to be able to make is for them to see the goodness of God in our home, the peace that's living in our yeah. home, because a lot of people are looking for peace. They're looking for joy. They're looking for all this in the wrong places. But when they see you at work, when they see you experiencing this at home, they're going 
going to go, what are they doing that I'm not doing? What is it that's about their life that I need more of? And so you can literally be the light of Jesus to others in your world and be so the good. disciple that you want to be simply by living it out loud yeah. at home so first. Good. Yeah. And so when we talk about those things, the very thing we want to talk about next, another essential, is intentional schedules. Come on, everyone say intentional schedules. Intentional schedules. That's a big one, right? You know, it's really important that we make sure that we keep our priorities straight. Because a lot of times we give our best to everybody else except for our spouse and the ones that we love the most. We, we're busy with our jobs. We're busy with our, our hobbies. We're busy with our buddies. Friends. We're busy with yeah. our girlfriends. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever it is. And we leave the leftovers for our spouse or the one that we love the most or even our children. And we're allowing the world to teach our children. We're allowing the iPads to be the parenting guide for our wow. children. We're allowing the TV to guide our children. And we need to have more face-to-face -face time with our children. It says that on average, a man spends seven minutes a day with his children. And that is a sad statistic because we don't want to leave the influence of our life to anyone else but ourselves. We as dads and moms, we need to step up and go, okay, it's not going to be all these outside sources that are going to parent my child. It's not going to be the outside sources that are going to be the influence and the major influence. Even the Sunday school teacher shouldn't be the major influence. You at home as the parent should be the major influence over your child, teaching and training and having face time, loving them and showing them that kind of love that they need desperately in their lives to make a difference. Yeah, and actually, here's one of my favorite statements I made throughout the years, that we should never live to prioritize our to-do list. Come on, we should have a to-do list that's full of our priorities. In other words, we shouldn't get so busy doing things, we're trying to figure out how to prioritize it. We should have our priorities in place to our to-do list, has those things that are priorities first. First things first, which that's is right. our family, our marriage, and all those things. We must prioritize our lives. Now, in Psalm 39, 6, here's what it says, we are are merely moving shadows, and all our busy rushing ends in nothing. Yeah. Ends in nothing. Come on, I'm saying nothing. Yeah. Then, then in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 6, it says, It is better to have only a little with peace of mind than be busy all the time. So I know this, that many times we're the creator of our own stress. Right. Half the world is stressed out or over half the world is stressed out, but a lot of them are creating their own stress, their right. own busyness. Right. I don't think at the end of the day, one of our children is going to say at the end of their life, I wish I could have played one more sport. I don't think anyone has ever said on their deathbed, I wish I could have spent one more day at the office. It's always the things we treasure that we wish we'd have done at the end of our life. We can start it now. We can do it today. Come on, we can get our schedules intentional. Amen? Come on. So I think that's very, very vitally important. So when we look at this, we have to say uh, that... Where are we at on this? Pat, they say to me all the time the various things, and I say priorities that drive us just to do a simple task or another task really isn't a priority, right? We, we our priorities should lead us to the heart of God. Come on, I'm going to say the heart of God. The heart of God. And so I, I look at it this way, that God moving in me gives me the life of passion, gives me the life of purpose. I've had people say to me, Pastor Kevin, it seems like now that you're 55 years old, you have more energy than you did when you was 40 years old. How do you do that? I can say, well, my schedule keeps me so busy. No, no, no. What I do is I get up every day and I say, in him I live and move and have my being. In his presence is fullness of joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen? Come on. Amen. And you can even get busy doing good things. You know, there's a, a man, the CEO of ARC, got a hold of my husband, yeah. and he wanted to speak to marriages of yeah. people in ministry. And maybe you want to share that. Of what yeah, uh, recently I had a, a conversation with the CEO of ARC, which is a, a group of people that start churches all over the world. And they ask us if we would come and speak to young ministers and their families because they now see so many young ministers and families that have that aggression that want to do something, but they're burning out. They're not really building upon what marriage is truly all about or what Right. family is all about. Right. That doesn't just happen in the secular world. It happens in our world as That's well. Right. But in the secular world or where you work or whatever you do, you have to understand that the family's in trouble only because we're not spending time together. Our priority, our schedule must be Jesus first, family next. Come on. And then all the other things really take place. That's right. And the next thing is vitally important for success is the correct relationship. Because mm. you are the 100% 
represent the sum total of your relationships. I'm sure you've heard this said before that, you know, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Yeah. The people that you're inviting into your world and you're letting speak into your world and you're hanging with, is you're not going to go any higher than what they are accomplishing in their lives. And we need to understand that, like, if you were here on Friday, you, you recognize the people that I allowed during my divorce, I had a friend that was speaking negative to me. She was speaking all the things that was against marriage. She was telling me all the things that I could be doing and why why I shouldn't be married and what all the and she's pointing out all the negatives about my husband. Not that I wasn't seeing him on my own, but you know those 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 man haters. There were know, so many. You know those man haters. They've got a divorce and they're just like hating men all over the place. And you're sitting in the next cubicle and they have nothing good to say about marriage. They have nothing good to say about people that are mm -hmm. you know trying to build a relationship and you don't need to continuously listen to the negativity of people around you even family members or people that are going to bash on your husband or bash on your yeah. wife or getting with groups of girls that are, are miserable in marriage no you need to hang around with people that are going to take you to so another good. level of so successful good. marriages i love that you guys invest in marriages here you need to jump into one of those groups so that you can successfully see what a great marriage is built upon surround yourself with relationships that are trying to get a better marriage and then then you're going to continue to build on each other yeah. going to the yeah. place that you want to go in your marriage and that's the same thing about parenting it's the same thing about no matter teenagers we say we, we want to you know gauge you know who our kids are hanging out with well how many times do we look at our own lives and say oh, maybe we should take the same look at our lives and saying, you know what, so good. maybe we shouldn't be hanging out with the people that we're hanging out with. And we need to really take it as a focal point of, we need to be successful in our Christian walk and small groups and the things that you get involved in here are going to put you in, in close proximity with those that are successful and going in the direction that you want to go inside of your life instead of hanging with those that are going to pull you down. Like when I, when I divorced my husband and I was pulled down when I decided to go dancing and clubbing and I got a, and, you know, kind of in close proximity and my relationships that I were, were, was building at the time, they were all doing drugs. So I thought, oh, you know what? They're okay. I, you know, they look like they're having a great they time. They weren't okay. <laughs> and so I tried crystal meth. I started in a drug world and I was pulled and sucked down into the world because of the relationships I allowed inside of my life. Mm. So be very careful. And, and, and that's like a bait of Satan. It's just, you know, there's a lot of fun friends to hang out with and we can go clubbing together and do nothing and it's innocent. No, Satan knows how to hook you and he's going to continue to pull you down a, a so path good. and a destiny of destruction if you don't. Don't really protect your heart and who you allow into your heart. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's for sure. Amen. Proverbs 27, 19 says, A mirror reflects a man's face, but what he is really like is shown by the kind of friends he chooses. And so Proverbs good. 13, 20 says, If you want to grow in wisdom, spend time with the wise. Walk with the wicked, and you'll eventually become just like them. Wow. So as I've gotten wiser, my circle of friendship is smaller in size but greater in value. Mm. So the older you get, the more wise you become. You realize and recognize maybe my friendships aren't as broad and as wide. They're smaller, but the quality of who they are and what I'm allowing into my life is going to take me to where I want to go in my life. That's very good. And so we want to give you some practical steps, relational steps that we need in order to have healthy relationships. These are some of those necessities that we talked about. But we have to have some steps. We have to have some principles to base it upon. And that's what we're going to talk about. So write these down in your notes if you're taking notes. Number one, here it is. I must recognize my own own faults. Come on, everyone say my own fault. It's easy to recognize the faults of another person. It's easy to see somebody who's not doing the right thing and be able to say, well, that's not right. Sometimes we're not careful. Self-objectivity is the hardest thing there is to look within ourselves. I found out for my healing, for what I had to have in my relationship, for God to restore my marriage, was I had to begin to look at myself and she had to begin to look at herself. It couldn't be me looking at her, her looking at me. So I say this to people all the time, that if you can start to look at yourself, you'll see some faults. What's good news is, as you begin to speak truth to yourself, it's the most powerful sermon you'll ever hear. What you say to yourself is the greatest thing you'll ever hear in your life. Can you say amen? That's right. When I was divorced from my husband and 
I was going through a time that I was, you know, just miserable. I was on drugs. I met a guy. We were doing drugs together. Well, he drove a beer truck, and he stole a keg to have a party with his friends, and he got <laughs> let go of that job. So here he is jobless. He's at home. He can't find a job. He doesn't really have a lot of motivation to find another job because we're doing drugs together and all of that. He was quite the loser. But... I, I really saw so much potential inside of him, and I kept telling him, and I would write notes to him of how great you are, and there isn't anything you can't accomplish, and there's, there's so many possibilities. You can even get a greater job. Just go for the stars. You have greatness in you. And one day I came home from work, and he was sitting on the couch, and I started to continue to cheerlead him on and let him know what greatness was inside of him. And he looked at me, he said, how did your husband ever let you go? And it was like the Holy Spirit slapped me in the face right at that moment. And he said, you were never this wife for your husband. Mm. And if you would have been this wife mm. for your husband, cheerleading him, supporting him, affirming him, building him up, you probably wouldn't have gone through the devastation and the misery and the divorce that you went through. And so when I was able to look at the ugliness of who I was in the marriage, I stopped pointing fingers at him and mad at him and blaming him for everything. I was able to look at myself and go, you know what? I had a responsibility. There were steps that led us to the place that we had the divorce. It mm. wasn't all his fault. I definitely had to part to play and in that there was forgiveness that was able to come for my husband and for the choices that he had made when I was able to take the responsible role of what I had participated so in and the part that I played in the destruction of our marriage so good Matthew chapter 7 I think it's a great scripture uh, it, it talks about this very issue of that wanting and needing and your heart to get ahead but in Matthew chapter 7 verses uh, 1 3 through 5 it says why do you stare at the splinter in your neighbor's eye but ignore the plank in your own? Now check that out. What he's saying is why do you look at that splinter in that person's eye when you got a log hanging at your head? That's quite the picture, right? You have a splinter, but I have a log. And then it goes on to say, how can you say to your neighbor, here, let me get that splinter out of your eye when you've got a plank in your own? You're just play acting. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly enough to take the splinter out of your neighbor's eye. I love it. Frank, Frank, come here. Just run up here real fast. Uh, come over here by me. No, come down here. I want Because you're taller than me. You have to be down there. Um, so let's say Frank has a splinter in his eye, which if you look close enough, he does. Because we all have splinters in our eyes. We all have faults. But if Frank has a splinter in his eye, I don't know if you've ever had anything in your eye and had to have someone help remove it or look for it. The one thing you don't want is you don't want coming up, you, someone coming up just being abrupt looking for that, you know, just kind of messing with you, right? You want them to be gingerly. You want them to get up close. You want them to have good lighting. You want them to come up precisely and just look real, real softly at you. But here's the problem. To do that, I've got to get up close. If I'm coming up close to get a splinter out of Frank's eye, but I got a log in my head, you know what's happening? Every time I get up there, I'm going, hey, boom, um, boom, um, boom, right? I'm causing more damage. Sorry, Frank. I'm, I'm causing, now you wish Benny was here. Huh? I'm causing more damage than good because I'm so busy looking at his splinter, I don't see the log in my own head. Come on, y'all with me. And think of this. It doesn't say don't get the splinter out of someone's eye. It says get that plank, that log out of your own head first so you can see clearly enough to come back in love, to come back precisely, to come back and say, I see that you'd be so much better if we could just get rid of it, but I've got to have it out of myself first. Can you say amen? amen. Thank you, Frank. Amen. So here's the statement. Those who blame lose the ability to change. If we're going to change, we can't cast blame anymore on our circumstances. It doesn't matter the way we were raised, the neighborhood we was in, the things that, that, that we didn't have. Here's the truth. All things are possible through Jesus Christ in our life. Amen? Amen. Which takes us to our next point. Give up my justification to get even. So many times in our society, even today, in today's world, we're so quick to give our opinions. We're so quick to fight back. When somebody makes an opinion or says something on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, we just, you know, we have that courage behind the computer and, and the keyboard, not the typewriter, but the keyboard, to be able to just blast people and, and not even give a thought about their heart or who we're offending. Yeah. We just want to give our yeah. opinions. We want to get back at them. We want them to be set straight. 
And we need to have an understanding that it, that is not the heart of God. Yep. In fact, Romans 12, 19 says, My friends, do not try to punish others when they are wrong, they, when they have wronged you, but wait for God to punish them with his anger. It is written, I will punish those who do wrong. I will repay them, says the Lord. Mm. So you need to have an understanding that we need to fight for relationships. We need to fight for unity. We need to fight for peace and not fight each other. Yeah. That's the heart of God is he's one in unity. You know, that's Satan's job, and that's what his one goal is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He's going to do it in your family. He's going to do it in your relationships because this is God's connection on earth. He came to earth and gave his heart and he gave his son to die on a cross so that we would have successful relationships, connecting with people because we are the only connection that some people will ever have right, with God. Right. And so we need to make sure that we're, we're fighting for the unity. We're fighting for the peace in our home, the peace in our relationships all around us so that they can see God through us. I remember a couple of the really extreme valuable lessons I learned. Uh, one was through our remarriage. Once God restarted marriage and we were living back together, together, married. Uh, I was, you know, I'd, I'd gone through a lot myself, but was learning lessons, and I was trying to make sure we weren't arguing, we weren't doing those things, and I remember one day we got into it. Ever, anyone ever get into it where now you're just trying to get even and forget getting even, now you're trying to get ahead, so she goes here and you go here, then she goes here and you go here. Come on, is anyone else married besides us? <laughs> and so one day I'm like, okay, I lost it. I mean, I just lost it. So I walked out, I slammed, I slammed the door, I went downstairs into the downstairs bathroom, and I grabbed the sink, I looked at myself in the mirror. This is how mad you are. You start talking to yourself. And I looked at myself and said, she makes me so mad. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, no, she don't make you mad. That's your emotion. You can choose to keep it or lose it, but it's up to you. And I thought to myself, this is not right. going to help anything. <laughs> this, this is not going to help anything, right? right? So I had to go back and I had to apologize because I was wrong. Although some of us up here have trouble admitting when we're wrong. <laughs> I was wrong, right? And, and another valuable lesson I learned when we were pastoring our church, we, we'd gone through a failed building program. It was just a terrible time. Uh, it was one of those gut-wrenching times as a church where you're trying to motivate the people to keep winning souls and everything just fell apart. In fact, we had already sold our building so we went from being in a stable place to being a mobile church for the next 10 years and one of the people that was ministering with us uh, he had lost his wife so I took him on and just met with him once or twice a week and prayed with him and would have lunch with him and encourage him and he, you know kind of nursed him back to ministry he would speak while I was gone and that type of thing and I found out after the after our building uh, failure I found out that he was causing division in the church and he just came against our body, literally causing division, causing uh, a church split. Uh, within, within a few days, uh, he had taken all of our business people that was with us and walked out the door. So $25,000 a week of our budget went out the door right away. And it was just a devastating blow to the church. Well, I was once again angry, and it seems like I'm an angry little elf right now, but um, I'm, I was really angry, and I said, God, I don't understand this, this isn't, this isn't the, I was never like this. I've always been loyal. I've been faithful to my pastor. I've been faithful to my friends. I'm a loyal person. I didn't sow this seed. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you're right. You didn't sow this seed. This is the seed he's sowing, but how you respond will be your seed. And I'll never forget that moment. It changed me forever to think, no, 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 no. I can never go back into thinking this is a seed I've sown. But my actions, my attitude, my heart, the words I say, the way I respond, they're the seeds we sow. I know in every relationship, even when it's turning upside down, I've got to sow the right seed. I've got to do the right thing. I can't think I'm going to get ahead. I'll never get ahead unless I first put Jesus in my life. Can you say amen? That's right. And which going leads me along, to number, with, oh, go going along with the seed, every deed is mm -hmm. a seed. Mm -hmm. Everything we say, and even that internal dialogue, the things that we're not saying, just the right. negativity that we're thinking is a seed that we're sowing towards a, a successful relationship or towards the demise of that relationship. So maybe you might say, well, I don't, I don't speak all these negative things out loud, but if you're thinking them, if the dialogue and the movie in your head is negative and you're having these arguments and these fights, you know how you have a fight with somebody and three weeks later you're like, oh, I should have said this. Oh, man. Doggone it. You mean it. three years later. <laughs> 
But those are seeds yeah. that you are planting yeah. either for your marriage, for your relationships in the successful way or for the destruction of it. So be careful what seed you're planting. So good. Last principle I want to give you, write this one down. Apply God's amazing grace yeah. to my relationship. I must apply God's amazing grace to my relationships. Grace is the key. Yeah. Um, and, and you might think, why is it called amazing grace? Here's why it's called amazing grace, because it never runs out. It never stops loving us. It never stops reaching out to us, the grace of God. And we need it because we're human. And because of our humanity, grace has to cover us completely. I don't know about you, but I know I need a lot of grace. I know for a fact that God's had to cover me with so much grace. Thank God it is amazing. But here's the thing. If I have to have it daily, the people around me have to have it daily as well. If I have to have it daily, then my wife has to have grace daily. If I have to have it daily, my children, my friends, my coworkers, they have to have grace daily. Right. And it's not just that we can allow Jesus to give that grace. We have to give that grace. Yeah. We have to make those concessions. We have to really say to ourselves, wait a minute, it's incredible the fact that this person I'm with is a great person. Although they have that fault, although they have that issue, I'm going to give grace to the issue. I'm not going to look there anymore. I'm going to find the good. Yeah. Grace is finding the good. Grace is seeing beyond what you've seen before. Grace is that which God wants you to give away because it mends relationships. Yeah. Come on. It brings it back to the place that it represents yeah. God. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 says, Be kind and loving to each other and forgive others just, forgive each other just as God forgave you in Christ. Come on. Grace is the capacity to accept, forgive, and understand others. We will never forgive more than Jesus has forgiven us. We will never be able to do that. But it said that's the way we're supposed to. Keep offering that forgiveness. So in order for God to restore our marriage, in order for me to be able to say, you know what? We're no longer the people we used to be because really I did get a new wife. I married the same woman, but she's a different person altogether. She'll tell you it's because she got a new husband, and it's probably true. But the thing is, in order for that to happen, we had to do one thing, and we had to lay our weapons down. Come on, everyone say, lay your weapons down. It might mean something different today, but in the Bible, if you look at stones, we still gather stones. There was a story in the Bible where a woman was caught in the very act of adultery. They brought her to Jesus and said, the law says she should be stoned. In fact, that was my first message back when we launched the church, the rock, was about the rocks that were in their hands that would either be a weapon of destruction, because that's how they were used many times, but you'll also see in times where they would pile rocks up in a pile as a memorial. So when they came into our first service, there was a rock under every chair. There was about 180 chairs, and there was a rock under every chair, and we were jammed. We had to bring more chairs out. It was a great thing because there were some people for us. There were some people just wanting to see what in the heck we were doing again. And there were some just judging us, saying, you shouldn't be doing this. So I had rocks under every chair, the size that would fit in a palm. And as I finished the service, I said, now everyone pick your rock up. And they had their rock in their hand. I said, I just want you to know that I have fallen, I have failed, I have blown it. And you have a rock in your hand that you can use as a weapon. So I just want to tell you right now, if that's you and you want to stone me and you have no sin and you have the right to stone me, go ahead and throw your rock. But I did say, hold on a second, I had a football helmet, I put it on first in case somebody took me up on the offer. I said, or... You can put your weapons down, you can bring them forward, and you can pile them up right here in front. And they all begin to come forward, piling their rocks up in a pile. And we call that our altar, our memorial of new beginnings. See, some of you here today, you need to build a memorial of new beginnings. You need to say to yourself, I'm placing my weapons at the foot of the cross. I'm placing, I'm putting my rock down. I'm going to stop gathering stones. I'm going to quit looking for a reason to be irritated. I'm going to quit looking for reasons that, that, I, can, that I can pick another fight. I'm going, to, I'm going to quit looking for reasons. I'm going to talk to myself in a way that grace covers me, but grace covers those around me. Come on, y'all with me. And some of you, no doubt, came in here and, 
you're thinking this is too tough. This is my last dish effort. If this doesn't work, I'm moving on. Can I just tell you don't do it? Can I just tell you that God, if he can change us, he can change anyone. If he can bless us, and if he is blessing anywhere, he's blessing you. You've just got to turn to him and lay your weapons down. Start finding the good. Start applying the grace of God. There's so much wrong in my past. This woman didn't have to forgive me. There's so much wrong in her past. I thought of earlier when Pastor Virginia was giving those flowery words to my wife and said she leaves the aroma of Jesus. I thought, yeah, you should have smelt my first wife. <laughs> I'm not sure Jesus is what you'd have smelt from either one of us. And, and that sounds funny, but here's the truth. Some people think their stuff don't stink. And we all stink. Every one of us. So while you're casting your stone at someone else, you remember what Jesus said, those who have no sin, let them cast the first stone. So let's not look at a splinter when we got a log. Let's take the grace of Jesus and apply it. I, I, I started to say, I promise, you know, God promises you that if you'll do that, you can have a brand new life. You can have a brand new marriage. You can have a brand new relationship with your parents or with your children or with your friends. God can restore things that you think are dead. God can bring back to life the things that appear to be dead. God can do anything. All things are possible to those who believe. And we just didn't have time to go through it all, even Friday, but as I was sharing with Pastor Mauricio in the office, not only drugs, we have so many things in our testimony that we can understand what you've been through. There's so many areas I wish I could sit and talk to you about that you couldn't look at us and go, you don't understand. We do understand. We understand more than you know because we've had our share. But I'll tell you right now, those are old people. These are new people. And the only difference is the grace of Jesus Christ that is amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.